about nuclear chemistry. I have a picture here of the one nuclear power plant that's in the state of Washington, and it's near Richland, Washington. All right, so obviously we're going to be talking about the nucleus if we're talking about nuclear chemistry. So what holds the nucleus together? You might have wondered, okay, if it's made of a lot of positive protons, wouldn't they just repel and the nucleus would fall apart? Well, it's true that there is this electrostatic force, the force that's pushing the protons apart, the repulsion. But there's something that's winning called the strong nuclear force that is actually attractive and holding the protons and neutrons together. So protons contribute to both this strong force and the repelling force, while neutrons contribute just to the strong attractive force. They're sort of like the glue that holds the nucleus together. The binding energy is the name for this strong force um, that holds the whole nucleus together. So it's also the name for the energy released when the atom is split. That's the binding energy. During nuclear reactions, even though we always talk about law of conservation of mass in quote unquote regular chemistry and nuclear chemistry, there's actually a change in mass. So you can see here this uranium is 238.0003 grams. And if you add the results of the products, 233.9942 and 4.0015, it actually adds to less than the mass that it started with. How can that be? Well, there's something called mass defect. So that's exactly what we just saw in the last slide. When a measured mass of an atom is actually less than the sum of the masses of its particles. And Albert Einstein was one of the scientists who first um, recognized that because some of the mass is used to hold the nucleus together, that there is actually a lot of energy and we can harness that. And Einstein actually wrote a letter to President Roosevelt when he discovered that um, it was possible to split an atom. So he wanted the president to make sure that Hitler in Germany was not going to build an, the first nuclear weapon before the United States did. So the E in E equals MC squared, the most famous equation of all time, um, the E actually stands for the binding energy um, in the nucleus of an atom. There's where he wrote the letter. Just wanted to remember to say that. So nuclear chemistry, like we said, is the study of the nucleus. And so we're going to be talking about neutrons and protons, not so much about electrons. So as a refresher in chemistry, we're really talking about arrangements of atoms. So example, H2 and O2 make H2O. But in nuclear chemistry, we're rearranging the nuclei, the protons and neutrons within the atoms. So this can also lead to radioactive elements. So regular chemical reactions, no. We're not making unstable isotopes of radioactive elements, okay? But that's why we don't do any nuclear chemistry uh, actual experiments in the classroom because obviously that would be quite dangerous. So let's talk about what radioactive means. So when an atom spontaneously breaks down into smaller chunks, um, it can release Particles, energy, or both. Okay, and we'll get into the specific types of radioactive decay. But imagine you are a nucleus of an atom. What if all of a sudden your arm just flew off of your body? 
and then your body flew away and your other arm flew away and your legs. Okay, that's exactly what it's like to be a nucleus undergoing radioactive decay. Some elements take thousands or millions of years to decay. Literally, like not in all of our lifetimes. And others just take fractions of a second to decay. I have an example of a uranium-238 decay chain, and we'll talk about it a little bit more um, after we go over alpha and beta decay. But you can see that its life is a long chain of what happens to it. It turns into thorium, then it turns into protactinium, then you're back to uranium, but a different isotope, then into thorium again, but a different isotope, then radium, then blah, 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 blah. Finally, it ends its life by changing into lead 206. Okay, but it's going to take a very, very long time. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, individual atoms can't go through this quickly, but it means that overall a sample of uranium-238 isn't going to change all of its sample into lead 206 for a very long time. So you might have heard about half-life before. The length of time it takes for half of a starting amount of an element to decay. So for example, radium has a half-life of 1,620 years. So if you've got 100 radium atoms, after 1,620 years, only 50 of them remain. The rest have decayed just like the chain we saw into something else, probably, you know, going towards stability. After another 16, 20 years, only 25 remain, and you could keep going and going and going until there were no atoms left. So total for this, for how long does it take for 75% to decay would be 3,240 years. So I just added these up. If an element has a shorter half-life, it's more radioactive because it's going to release that energy in those smaller particles faster. So which element's more radioactive? Carbon-14, which has a half-life of 5,720 years, or radium-226, which has a half-life of 1,620 years? Answer, radium-226, because it has that shorter half-life. All right, one more example for you to do. You've got a sample of 200 radioactive atoms. The half-life is 20 years. So after 20 years, only 100 are gonna be left. So keep going with that. After a total of 100 years, how many atoms will be left? And what I mean by how many atoms, I mean how many radioactive atoms. So. Pause the video and see if you can solve this. It's 100 divided by 20. That's five half-lives. So after one half-life, there's 100 left, and then there's 50 left, and then there's 25, and then there's 12.5, and then there's 6.25 left. So we would round to six because you can't have a quarter of an atom. So after 100 years, six of those original radioactive atoms are remaining. How can this be useful? Well, you might have heard of radioactive carbon dating, and basically all of us have some carbon-14 in us, which decays. After we die, they can actually compare how much carbon-12 to carbon-14 do we have because our body is not gonna continue to get new carbon-14. And so since it's starting to decay, they, this is how they actually figure out how old fossils are. But if it's older than like 60,000 years, they actually use uranium-238 because its half-life is much larger. So they can use that to date old rocks. And uh, the picture here is just showing how carbon-14 forms and how it gets into our bodies because cosmic rays 
basically collide with atoms and create these neutrons, which combine with nitrogen and it decays into carbon-14, which acts very similar to regular carbon, carbon-12. So plants absorb it, we eat plants, we get carbon-14. Or plants absorb it, animals eat the carbon-14, and then we eat the animals, unless you're a vegetarian or a vegan, in which case you're still eating plants. So, um, so yeah. Let's talk about the other types of radiation here. Let's talk about specific types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha radiation is when, remember that example I said where if your entire body was a nucleus and your arm flew off? Well, what if the, your arm was the size of a helium nuclei? So it was a mass of four and it was two protons and two neutrons. Okay, that is very specific in the chunk, the size of the chunk that's leaving the nucleus, but it's very common and it's called alpha decay. This isn't something to really worry about because alpha particles are so large that they can be shielded by even a piece of paper, okay, or your skin. So if you would not want to ingest them, but they can't, um, get through your skin very easily. Uh, it's been a problem though, because before they knew that um, alpha particles were harmful when you ingest them, um, they were putting, for example, this so radia face cream out there to consumers. And it was really popular in France in beauty products, perfumes, the face cream, and it had radioactive elements in it. And um, they even advertised it as a creation of Dr. Alfred Curie, although there was no such person. So um, again, anyone who was putting that on their face and possibly ingested it um, was not, that is not okay. Um, here's an example of a radioactive product that um, was put out there where they said that this will cure stomach cancer and mental illness. They called the radium-226-228 water perpetual sunshine. And there was a guy that decided to drink a bottle every day and because uh, he wanted to be healthy. And uh, he did that for four years and he died of excruciating pain um, because he got cancer of the jaw, which caused his facial bones to disintegrate. So, awful. They even used to sell atomic energy lab kits to kids, which actually contained radioactive material for kids to experiment with. They still were selling it up until the late 1970s. Um, and again, although it was relatively safe because the alpha particles, for example, emitted, are, you know, can't get through your skin. Um, you still probably wouldn't want your kids playing with it uh, just in case they lick it or something. They've also even had radium chocolate sold in Germany in the early 1930s. Again, this is before they knew the awful effects of the radioactive atoms. Second type of decay we're going to talk about is beta decay. And this is when an electron is emitted from a nucleus and a neutron is converted into a proton. This particle that leaves has a negative charge. Beta particles also are too large to penetrate your skin um, and they can be stopped with a piece of aluminum foil. The third type of radioactive decay, however, is a gamma ray, and this is the highest energy. It's not a particle. It doesn't have mass. It doesn't have a charge. Um, it often is emitted along with beta or alpha radiation, but this can penetrate your skin. Oops. It can be stopped with lead, just like x-rays, but it's even higher energy than x-rays. And of course, you've probably seen a lot of comics and sci-fi movies um, love to talk about radioactivity and 
turning you into like the Hulk. So I wanted to show some nuclear reactions written out. And so here is a uranium atom. It's got a mass of 238, 92 protons. And if it loses an alpha particle, you can see it. you subtract 4. So 238 minus 4 is 234. And you subtract 2 protons, so 92 minus 2 is 90. Okay, so alpha decay is splitting that nucleus into two smaller elements, one of which is always a helium nucleus. So your turn. Here we've got polonium 210, 84. Don't look at the right side. See if you can kind of write that out on your own. Pause the video, do a little bit of practice. Okay, and then let's look at a beta decay reaction. We've got a carbon-14 that is emitting this beta particle. And the mass stays the same, and the number of protons goes up by one. Every time there's beta decay, that's the same pattern. Okay, so you try. There's another reaction started for you so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do that one okay let's take a look silicon 27 mass stays the same but the number of protons goes up by one it changes into a phosphorus atom when a beta particle is emitted okay there's more practice please pause the video See if you can write out these nuclear reactions using the periodic table off to the side. And then I'm going to put up the answers so you can check your work. All right, so back to this uranium-238 decay chain. Now you can see why after it loses an alpha particle, the mass goes down by four. But once it emits a beta particle, the mass stays the same, but the element number goes up by one. Same thing, mass stays the same after another beta particle, and the element number goes up by one. What are some uses for radioactive elements? We're going to talk about nuclear medicine, nuclear power, and atomic weapons. So nuclear um, medicine, you probably have heard about people having cancer going to radiation therapy. So yes, too much radiation can cause cancer, but you can also use a mechanism where radiation beams knock electrons off of atoms um, in the DNA chains and turn them into free radicals, which damages them. So here are some elements that are commonly used in radiation therapy. And again, they can target those beams to the cancerous cells. But they also kill healthy cells too, um, which is why people undergoing radiation often don't feel very well and they lose their hair and, and other side effects. Nuclear power, they're... Um, are two aspects that we are going to talk about, fission and fusion. Fission means splitting a big heavy nuclei, like a uranium. The products are radioactive. Okay? When you do this, you release a lot of energy, which can be used, and it's green energy, meaning that it's not releasing carbon dioxide, like when we burn coal and burn natural gas and, and things like that. So nuclear power plants and most nuclear weapons rely on this nuclear fission to get their energy. There's also nuclear fusion, which is the combination of two or more light nuclei, like a hydrogen and a hydrogen fusing to make a helium. The products are not reactive. They do require extremely high temperatures in order to fuse, like sun and stars. And we aren't very good at nuclear fusion yet. A lot of people are working on 
how to control it. You've probably heard about chain reactions before. Um, in a fission reaction, you bombard a neutron into an atom, it splits it, and it releases more neutrons, which hit more atoms, which split, and more and more and more, and you can see that this effect, you know, is cumulative and um, exponential in that. And so you need to figure out how to control it in a situation like a nuclear power plant. Here's a picture of some fusion reactions happening in the sun. So more about fusion, again, it requires very high temperatures. Um, and you may have heard of hydrogen bombs. They're a thousand times more powerful than a fission bomb. How does a nuclear power plant work? Just the basics. They bombard a, an atom, a large heavy nuclei, with a neutron. And this starts a chain reaction. And the energy is used to boil water and generate steam, which spins a turbine which spins copper wire through or between magnets, which causes electrons to move. And so that makes electricity. And going back to this again, this is a green process. However, there are uh, a lot of other things made besides energy. So the nuclear waste has to be dealt with. And oftentimes, you know, as you saw in the decay chains, they can take, you know, forever to decay. And so they have to find a place to put those products, that waste. A little bit about atomic weapons. There are fusion and fission weapons. Two nuclear weapons have been detonated, both by the United States at the end of World War II. Where were these dropped? So maybe you can shout at the screen right now. Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. In Hiroshima, the atomic bomb was dropped on August 6, 1945. It was a uranium bomb and it killed a lot of people. Nagasaki was dropped three days later and it ended the war and it was a plutonium bomb. The plutonium for this atomic weapon was actually made in the state of Washington, which is why our state is the most contaminated as far as nuclear waste out of all of the states in the United States. So how did they make these atomic weapons? Well, there was a big top secret project called the Manhattan Project. And it was started by that letter that I had talked about um, that Albert Einstein helped to write uh, FDR, President Roosevelt. And he put together a team of the brightest and top scientists from all over the world to come together to develop the world's first nuclear weapon. Robert Oppenheimer was the person who was put in charge of, of everyone. He's called the father of the atomic bomb. He was successful in that they did end up detonating the first atomic bomb in New Mexico is where they tested it. And um, he later in life became anti-nuclear and uh, very depressed. Um, because, you know, that had to be very difficult knowing that you made this weapon and yet, or helped to make this weapon and yet it, you know, destroyed so many lives. And so um, definitely controversial and um, a very sensitive issue. The two main types of nuclear weapons are, of course, uh, what we've discussed, the fission bombs. And there's also fusion bombs. Only six countries have detonated one. I talked about this earlier, how they're a thousand times more powerful than a fission bomb. So the six countries that have detonated one are the United States, Russia, the UK, China, France, and India. In 2016, North Korea claimed to have tested a fusion weapon, but this claim is has been disputed. 
You might have heard of nuclear fallout, the residual radiation hazard left over from a nuclear explosion. And it's called that because it, quote, falls out of the atmosphere into which it's spread. And there have been three big nuclear disasters which have had varying amounts of fallout. The first of the three biggest was Three Mile Island, which was a partial nuclear meltdown in 1979 in Pennsylvania. Chernobyl, which was the worst nuclear disaster known in our time. Um, it happened in Ukraine in 1986. 5% of their radioactive nuclear core was actually released into the atmosphere. And Fukushima had an earthquake and a tsunami, which disabled the power supply and the cooling mechanism for three nuclear reactors in Japan. And so those cores melted down. And we're wrapping up with how are elements made? So the Big Bang started everything and made hydrogen and helium. And after that, stars made the rest of the um, elements. So cooler stars, uh, like the sun is considered a cooler star. It fuses hydrogen atoms to make helium. Bigger, hotter stars can make heavier elements up to iron. And supernovas, which are explosions of stars, create heaviest elements up to uranium, number 92. And I should say iron is number 26. So how does this work? Well, for the smaller atoms, literally two, when there's plenty of heat energy, two smaller nuclei can combine and form a larger one. The elements heavier than iron are made by something called neutron capture. It's a two-step process where an atom fuses with neutrons and then undergoes a, a beta decay to make a larger atom. And then elements above number 92, you might wonder, how do they make those? Like element, you know, 118, which is the last one on the periodic table. So these are called super heavy elements. And they, the way that they do this is they accelerate, sort of like a bowling game, um, atoms at each other, nuclei, and then they hope that they stick together when they collide. Afterwards, they separate out their different atoms, and then they detect the new super heavy elements. Some of them don't exist very long. So that is it for an introduction to nuclear chemistry. I know that was a lot um, and you'll get to choose in your project what you want to explore a little bit more.